right, guys, welcome to Tech Guru. Today with us we have Cole Simmons, and at age 19, he dropped out of Stanford University, and for about the last three years, he's been working on his company, Abstract, which is working on commercial real estate. Welcome, Cole. Thanks for having me. What is your company, Abstract? Yeah, so Abstract is the, is the easiest way for commercial real estate professionals to extract and manage their portfolio-related data. This data is typically found in property documents, like leases, um, amendments, notices, etc. What would a real estate professional do without your software? The way it's done right now, and it, it's really astounding being that you know commercial real estate is the largest asset class in the US, that it just is still so archaic and they do everything manually. Uh, I think that's why a lot of times you see some of these companies um, are just massive, the number of employees they have, because they their solution to problems is just to throw people at them. Typically, extracting this data from the documents is called abstracting, hence the name. They'll have an analyst, maybe with two monitors. They'll have the document on one monitor, they'll have a spreadsheet on the other, and they'll just kind of go line by line through this lease, pull out the data points. It takes about an hour per lease. If we're talking about you know an office or a retail property, there can be 50 tenants. So you're looking at 50 hours per property. Some of these portfolios have thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, properties. And this process is also done repeatedly. This abstracting process is done by every kind of potential party. It's done by you know, the owners, it's done by the brokers they bring on, it's done by all of the potential bidders. A lot of their time is spent just extracting this data manually and then re-abstracting, re-abstracting, re-abstracting. So with abstract, you, know, you, can, you can link the data to where it occurs in a contract. The most familiarity I have is with rental documents. Mm -hmm. So for the example of rental document, I fill out a lot of personal information. Yeah. So would a professional take all of that and try to record a new version of that every quarter? These leases tend to be really uniform. Um, it's kind of just Mad Libs. They'll fill in the tenant name. They'll fill in what your rental rate is. So the abstracting process for this doesn't take too long. With office, with retail, with industrial, it tends to be a lot less uniform. And so that's part of where this complexity comes in. As far as what types of data points they're trying to extract, a lot of times it is lease commencement date, lease expiration date, what's the rental rate, do they have a termination option. So you said that the majority of the complexity comes from industrial, so things like corporations are taking over a piece of land. That's mm -hmm. when the paperwork gets really complex. Industrial tends to be more like warehouses. Industrial is probably the least complex because generally it'll have one tenant. If you look at it like a you know some sort of warehouse or factory, uh, it's really office and retail, so office buildings, Generally, they'll have like one anchor tenant that may take two floors, but then for the rest of the floors, there's there's a lot of smaller offices, and then retail. You have like you know, malls. Were you working in real estate or no? So my my co-founder Max graduated from Georgia Tech in 2011 and worked in commercial real estate private equity for I think five or six years. After that, I had also previously worked in a commercial real estate startup, a different one, which is actually kind of how I. I met Max. I, I worked there with his uh, with his brother, with his sister, with his like roommate and best friend, who kind of kind of connected us together. That gave me a little bit of uh, exposure to the industry. He kind of gave me my, my education. In commercial real estate was really patient as I've kind of asked the same questions over the <laughs> three years we've been working together. So you ultimately dropped out at age nineteen. Yeah, it's it's and I mean it's a really personal decision because the kind of parameters when you're making the decision change a lot case by case. But for me, it was. Sophomore year, I went back for winter break. I'm from Georgia, so I went back to Atlanta. I was meeting with my friend Spencer. He, he was asking me if I had any side projects I was working on. I said no. He told me about, he was like, oh, you know, Max and I are kind of working on this, this thing. Connected us together. Was not expecting it to be a big thing. Thought maybe I'd just do a couple hours a week. He had other things he was working on. There was a non-compete involved. So I ended up just being me and Max. We did customer discovery. Max kind of told me about the market, about the problem. And I said to him what a lot of VCs have said to me, right? Which is just like, if what you say is true, then this is going to be successful, it's going to be lucrative, but that would require me to take you entirely on your word. So that was in January. And from January until June, we did as much customer discovery as we could. We ended up talking to over 100 commercial real estate professionals. In that time, our focus kind of changed from that, that transaction side to focusing more on the holding period. And I was just asking some of the dumbest questions to these people, but they, they, they were, they were um, patient. They, they kind of explained. I remember my first call, I was like, 
this guy was like, yeah, so I work in investment sales. And it kind of went on this, this whole tirade. And, and I kind of had to be like, so what's investment sales? So, but some of these people we're, we're now talking uh, with, again, as potential customers. I always make a point to tell them how it's kind of a, a product of their own making because they you know, kind of showed with their experience in the market where they see the pain points. So your primary thing was to talk to 100 people in the space to find out what their actual pain points are. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I think customer discovery is one of the most crucial stages of any company. And it's also not a thing that you do entirely at the beginning. It's a continuing process throughout the life of the company. It's something that we're still doing. We're still, you know, every time we have an idea for a feature or we build something, we always make sure to kind of put it in front of people. There's a whole science to it. There's, there's a way of asking questions. If you phrase questions certain ways, you'll, you'll get only the answers you, you want to hear or what they think you want to hear. So open-ended versus closed-ended questions? It is largely open-ended and also kind of following these, these paths as they you know, stop and be like, oh, I think, you know, it sounds like this is, this is really important to you. You've mentioned it a few times. Rather than just putting something in front of them and being like, is this useful? Yeah, that, that was a super important part of the process, but it also kind of showed me that Max was right. And there are huge inefficiencies in this market that it was really a problem worth solving. I had worked at, at some startups in, in Atlanta and Atlanta is really, it's not known as a startup city, it's kind of a cozy, cozy little startup scene. And this was, this was in high school and it made me really excited about the idea of starting something one day because everybody was helping each other, everybody was, everybody was kind of focused on things that they believed mattered. And then I came out here and I just really did not like a lot of the aspects of kind of the startup culture here. It feels, it feels fake. It feels like a lot of people are in it for kind of the wrong motivations okay. and just lack any sense of self-awareness. I don't think they're clear with themselves or with others about what their incentives are. They take for an example, there was somebody in my freshman dorm that, that created a uh, app for finding parties. I mean, he was always like, you know, it's a revolution. Join the revolution. It's like, you're making an app for parties. People are in it more for the sake of being in it. They want to start something for the sake of starting something because they maybe dream of being a household founder name like Zuck or Dorsey. They'll start something that, you know, they don't even really believe in. It's kind of a means to an end. And the end is that they want to be seen as a visionary. I just roll my eyes anytime anybody tells me that they're, you know, they're kind of starting a startup. I kind of expect back to the same people to do that to me. And so I've been careful to never kind of describe Abstract as a startup. You describe it as a project mostly? As a project, as a business, as a, as a you know, a, a web app or something. But um, startup just feels a lot of times when people say it like they, sure. that they want to be somebody that's in a startup. When I came into Stanford, I would tell my family, I'm going to do two years and I'm going to drop out and I'm going to start something. My parents were like, no, you're not. After being at Stanford for a year, I started telling my family, I was like, oh, you know, maybe I'll just do a co-term, which is where you get a master's. Um, okay. We work on the master's at the same time as, as bachelor's. So I'll do the whole five-year thing and then I'll get a company or I'll get a job at a, one of those large companies. And then uh, I met Max and then we started doing this and I went back kind of back to the two years thing. The decision itself is... Part of it depends on the school. So Stanford is really good in that they kind of, you can kind of come back at any time in, in your life right. and pick up where you left off, right. which reduces the risk. Because some of the other schools, some of the Ivy League schools, for example, I think require you to reapply. You also lose all of your credits. So that would have changed it a lot because that makes it feel a lot more final rather than something that you can, you can try out if it doesn't work. You know, you can always go back. Though having safety nets can be uh, kind of a downside. That was part of it. The other part of it is just kind of like this this other definition of risk. I think Sam Altman of YC has kind of defined it in a way that's resonated with me the most, which is people always talk about college as a very low risk thing, but that's not necessarily the case and is becoming less the case every year. It also kind of depends on the, the, the finances with the, the cost of education rising, kind of like what your financial aid situation is, who's paying what. It's expensive and you're potentially using four of the most productive years of your life. It just didn't seem that risky to me. The decision really had to be made when I was looking at um, doing kind of an internship because it was like do the internship and then come back to school or do none of it. The prospect of moving back to Georgia didn't seem great. <laughs> the prospect of not making money for a while didn't seem great. It just seemed like it wasn't going to be something that I regretted. As of right now, I'm glad I did it. So what did your parents think once you made that leap and what did they think now? They were actually really supportive, being that they had always told me growing up that like, you're going to college and not even question. When I had talked about dropping out before, they were, they were saying like, oh, you know, you're not gonna do that. I think they saw, you know, that I had been working on it for six months already, like validating that this was was something worth working on, that we had kind of a clear path and vision forward. So going back to abstracts, like how do you and Max split up the work between you two? 
It's been pretty easy. I mean, I, I've been the sole engineer. I mean, when we were doing customer discovery, we just kind of set quotas that we both wanted to hit. I think we would talk to maybe 10 people a week or something like that. Since then, since I started writing code, it's been me doing that and then him actually talking to these customers, putting things in front of them, continuing the customer discovery process, building these connections. And then we kind of work together on a lot of the design of the stuff and, and the user interaction. How many customers has Abstract landed? So we are working with our pilot customers right now. Our landing page right now is still is still kind of like a stealth mode, you know, put in your email. It's one of the hard things about building for enterprise. I think a lot of the problems worth solving are in enterprise. One of the tricky things is that people always talk about the MVP. What's the, what's the smallest set of features that you have to build before somebody will pay money for this? That bar is a lot higher in enterprise because they're going to want complex access controls to be able to kind of define which of their employees can read or write certain things. They want to meet security standards a lot of times, whether that's like ISO or PIPA or SOC, depending on what industry you're in. And then a lot of times they'll, the incumbent solutions they have. So the bar is high. So we got to a place where we kind of, it was kind of a baseline finished product. It's a subscription, I mean, it's SaaS. So we, with the pilot customers, we've been working on some of them are, you know, six uh, figures, seven figures in, in annual revenue. But one of the side effects I'm hoping to have with Abstract is that it, it kind of levels and democratizes the playing field here so that, you know, mom and pop shop will have the same kind of speed of processing all this data is, is somebody as large as like CBRE or Cushman and Wakefield. What are some of the challenges over the last three years? Like what's one of the biggest challenges that you and Max have had to face? The biggest challenge I'd say is it's really just figuring out kind of what to build. It's the customer discovery process, but it's also doing it in a way that it's just so easy to end up trying to validate your own ideas rather than actively trying to invalidate them. Because if you can't, then that's how you know you're onto something. We started actually with a proof of concept app just to kind of test whether there was value in this linking data points to their to their document. That was built pretty quickly. It was built with like Firebase. Then we would put it in front of people and we'd actually try to sell it too. Because then if you put it in front of people and you say like, oh, do you like this? Then maybe they'll say yes. But if you put it in front of them and say, all right, like we want money for this, yeah. then you kind of find out why it's a no. And so that's kind of when we realized that we kind of had to build it up from the ground up with customization in mind. It's one of the pr things that makes this kind of a technologically tricky problem. It's a lot easier if you have kind of a fixed set of values that you think the user's trying to extract. So if you just have a fixed template that says, oh, they're probably trying to extract commencement, expiration date, that's, those are a lot easier to find, but everybody kind of extracts this data differently. And so we allow the user to kind of define these templates and what those types are. So then we, we kind of rebuilt it from the ground up with these things in mind, with the access controls in mind. Now we're still, we're still kind of learning what we have to do to get there, but we also didn't want to kind of do the, the typical Silicon Valley growth model, which is just raise way before you're ready <laughs> at a valuation that your revenue will never be able to match and hire so quickly that you, know, you can't kind of focus on you know, kind of what's, what's a good internal culture, who's gonna actually be a good fit, and then really just try to you know, get in, get out as quick as you can. Right. We're trying to build it a lot slower, a lot more sustainably, and stay, stay lean, stay scrappy. One of the last questions, what's your daily schedule? Daily schedule is it's a little off right now, but what I try to do is wake up at you know, six, and then really just immediately try to get into deep work for about four or five hours. I'll generally turn off any sort of communication, email, Slack, whatever, and then just kind of write code. Then I'll spend a lot of the rest of the day either doing some sort of like communication, just talking with other employees, other contractors, kind of about where they stand with certain projects, reading, working on just general music stuff, working on screenwriting is another hobby. Try to be a lot more deliberate in, in 2019 about trying to make progress on a few different categories every day. Last question is, are you guys hiring? We are, yeah, we're, we're focused mo mostly right now on um, kind of UI UX, but we also definitely need kind of DevOps, um, especially, and then machine learning engineers. Um, it's looking with like some of these pilot customers, like we're gonna, we're about to scale quickly, so. And how can the viewers get in touch with you if they it, were interested in the job? It is uh, cole at abstractcre.com. CRE is commercial real estate. It's a few other abstracts out there. Okay, very There's cool. Get Abstract, there's Go Abstract. Or abstract CRE. It's Cole at? Yes. Abstract. CRE. CRE. Dot com. Dot com. All right. That wraps up for today. Thank uh, you, Cole. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Awesome.